Okay, I'm back for part two of, week, of our second week uh, discussing the Mafia. Uh, we talk about uh, the Mafia in America. Uh, this wonderful organization that goes by so many names. Uh, you know, and, 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 you know and other, all the different terms I use just understand they're synonyms for the same group. Uh, the mob, the outfit, uh, La Cosa Nostra, uh, the office, the family. Um, Italian organized crime uh, in America. Just tons of names. And if you ask one of them, they'll tell you there's no such thing as a mafia. The American mafia draws its traditions uh, from... Hold on. The American mafia draws its traditions from the Sicilian mafia, uh, as well as its business practices. Uh, the first appearance of the Mafia in the United States occurred in 1850 uh, as activity resulting from immigration uh, from Italy to New Orleans. Uh, there was this group known as the Black Hand that you can read about in your textbook. Uh, became, uh, they became, they had this, they, they had this inked handprint signature that they used, which is how they kind of got the name Black Hand. Um, and they'd leave it in some of their crime scenes. But this really wasn't a single group. This was a bunch of independent uh, groups under the, uh, rather than uh, one being controlled by a central boss. Um, you know, they were involved in various crimes, usually extortion, gambling. Most of their money came, most of their illegal money came from skimming money from every economic transition, trans, from economic transactions committed by the poor. Oops. Uh, it seemed like the poor in New Orleans, every time they wanted to do anything, you know, anytime money changed hands uh, in the poor districts of New Orleans uh, in the 1850s, uh, some of that money uh, went through the mob. mob. Um, they did spread out to other cities from there. Uh, probably the most notable event uh, in the early history of the mafia in the United States is the murder of David Hennessy, uh, the chief of police of New Orleans in 1890. Um, he was um, he was central to uh, a contested vote uh, and a con in some contested territory down by the docks between the Provenzano family uh, and the Matraga uh, clan. Uh, allegedly, Hennessy had some connection to the Provenzanos. Uh, it's never really been proven, as far as to my uh, from what I can see. Uh, Hennessy claimed uh, claimed that he hated the Italian immigrants, uh, uh, or he uh, he claimed disdain for Italian immigrants. Put that way, uh, announced he would expose Italian organized crime, uh, and you know he said this publicly enough times that on October fifteenth of eighteen ninety he was assassinated. And the, the New Orleans police, they did what any good uh, old school police agency did. They rounded up the usual suspects. Um, they rounded up about 18 Italian Americans, uh, arrested them, found not guilty. And when they were found not guilty, uh, a mob of New Orleans citizens decided to take matters into their own hands. A uh, mob broke out. Uh, they lynched 11 people, not all of whom uh, were among the 18. Uh, Italian Americans who are arrested. Now, but that's really kind of an isolated, this New Orleans black hand, kind of an isolated thing. They spread about to the, but really, the real, it was really the later immigration from Sicily, particularly 1970, 1970 1917, uh, that really established uh, the American mafia. Uh, and what you get here, remember when we talked in the last video, we talked about. The mass immigration from Sicily, 1910, 1913, in that area, and then the, the mobsters followed in 1917. Well, they, there's the mobsters coming to the United States, they quickly established themselves. Um, obviously, they had money when they came over, as they were fleeing Mussolini. And with money comes power, and it is the Italians that come in, that were in here previously, are still poor and uh, having trouble finding jobs, and the, the normal problems of immigrants at the time. 
where you saw the formation of a padrone system, basically what, what we call a padrone system, where these men of honor, these uh, uh, mafiosi, they uh, they just kind of they look at it as like benefactors for the people. They uh, they helped them find jobs and, and housing and credit. And they became popular figures in their neighborhoods. Uh, there was, uh, particularly the Sicilians were perceived, uh, and all the Italian immigrants were perceived to be criminals. And so the police tended to ignore the Italian Americans when they would complain about crime. And after a while, they, the, Sicilian, the Italian Americans, particularly the Sicilian Americans, got tired of being ignored by the police and turned to the mobsters for protection. Which is ironic, because again, the mobster, mob was more than happy to provide protection. Uh, particularly since they were providing protection from themselves, or at least something else they had their hands in. It was truly prohibition that created vast opportunity for the mob. Um, that allowed the, the American Mafia to expand its power. And then I'm not going to talk about the Prohibition. I'm not talking about the Prohibition. I'm not going to talk about Prohibition this week. Uh, we're going to talk about Prohibition when we get to the chapter in the book on vice crimes in America, and then we'll talk about Prohibition in detail. Just understand for now that uh, Prohibition is what really allowed the Mafia in America to grow and gain a foothold uh, with local politicians. And then for the rest of this video, rather than go over stuff that's in the book, um, what I'd like to do is tell you some stories of some individuals, uh, notable individuals in, in American, Italian-American organized crime. Um, not all of them being Italian-Americans, but these guys are all connected to one another, so I want to tell their stories. Um, and then maybe you might use some of their stories as examples when you go to answer your midterm. The first guy I want to talk about uh, is Arnold Rosti, uh, considered the first Don, um, you know, so-called Don of American organized crime. Uh, we're talking mid 1920s here. Uh, Rosti was the first to apply a business-like model to organized crime, and so uh, all those things we talked about, I talked about last week about business practices that the mafia uses. Rosti was the one that really started uh, this movement, this idea of running organized crime like a business. Uh, and again, those things like chain of command, job specialization, etc. cetera. Um, Rothstein's organization included a lot of, several notable people, including Frank Costello, uh, who was the man who took over for Lucky Luciano uh, when Luciano went to prison. Um, and Rothstein was notable for expanding uh, the mafia across the country. Now, who is this guy, Rothstein? Uh, this is a this is a colorful character here. Uh, at age three, yes, age three, uh, Rothstein was found uh, holding a knife over his older brother. Uh, great start to life, right? Uh, by age fourteen, he was making money gambling in Manhattan around his neighborhood. Uh, by sixteen, he was loan sharking, uh, and usually he was. Charging twenty points, I'm about twenty percent interest on most of his loans. He he had a he had an easy, uh, very nice slogan: "Loans by Monday, payable next Monday." And we'll talk next week, or maybe next week after. I can't remember at the top of my head, but we'll talk in the next couple of weeks about how loan sharking works. You'll you'll love it. Um, at age sixteen, he gained the attention of Big Tim Sullivan, uh, one of the a boss in on the east side of New York. And he took young Rothstein in as an errand boy. Um, Rothstein grew uh, to have a reputation. Uh, and he was he had some strange habits uh, in this reputation. He was a um, kind of a peculiar individual. He, uh, he drank only milk, which <laughs> made him stand out among these guys. Um, he was always impeccably dressed. Um, uh, you know, respected good women. He's just he's kind of a character. Um, probably what he's most known for is for fixing sporting events, in addition to some of these other things. Um, very well known for fixing sporting events and then gambling or gambling on fixed sporting events. 
Um, many of you have heard of the Black Sox, uh, Black Sox scandal in 1919, where um, the outcome of the World Series was fixed. Uh, Rothstein, uh, apparently Rothstein didn't actually arrange for the fix, but he knew enough about it uh, that Rothstein promoted uh, the fix among uh, gambling in, in the uh, in the underworld. Uh, Rothstein personally made about three hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars off the nineteen nineteen World Series. Um, you're thinking three hundred fifty thousand dollars, big deal. Remember nineteen nineteen three hundred fifty thousand dollars is a lot of money. Um, Rothstein owned a piece of a bunch of different businesses both legal and illegal. Um, he was particularly into real estate, um, heavily into bookmaking and bootlegging. And we'll talk about what those things are later. Um, and insurance scams. Uh, he ran trade unions, uh, operated bail bonds businesses. Uh, in 1914, when the Harrison Narcotics Act was passed, um, Rothstein... Uh, uh, was instrumental in organizing shipments uh, of, of heroin into into the city of New York. Ironically, uh, Rothstein met his end November fourth, nineteen twenty eight, in, in in a Park Central hotel. And I say ironically because uh, he was shot and killed over a gambling debt they didn't pay. Go figure. Let's see. The next character uh, I want to talk to you about is Dutch Schultz, Dutch Schultz. Um, Dutch was actually born um, Arthur Flingenheimer. Uh, if my if I was born Arthur Flingenheimer, I'd probably change my name too. Um, born in the Bronx in New York about 1904. Um, his father abandoned him uh, and his family uh, when he was about 14, and so young Dutch 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 young Dutch the young Dutch dropped out of school, and you know this is very common in that time. Uh, you know, if something happened to the head of the household, the oldest son would take over supporting the family or helping mom support the family. Well, Dutch did this by committing burglaries rather than getting a job. Go figure. Um, he soon came under the tutelage of Arthur, of Rothstein, uh, established himself as a bootlegger working for Rothstein in the 1920s, and began taking over speakeasies, uh, uh, in the Manhattan area, in association with a couple other notable mobsters, uh, including uh, Vincent Mad Dog Cull and Legs Diamond, uh, both of whom decided that they were making, they enjoyed the money they were making with the speakeasies, decided to take uh, take the businesses away from Dutch, and so Dutch had them killed. Uh, but they were good friends. It doesn't pay to be Dutch's friends, by the way. Uh, 1913, uh, it's 1932, excuse me, 1932, Dutch began running numbers. Um, and we'll talk about numbers running next week, but just for now, think of uh, numbers running as a private individual running his own pick three lotto, which is pretty much numbers running is. And again, next week, week after, we will talk, I will describe how numbers running, how the numbers racket is done. Um... Dutch, uh, particularly associated with a man named Otto Berman, uh, him and Otto figured out a way uh, to alter the odds in their favor, and so he got rich, rich in the numbers racket. Uh, his his ex, his exposure to powers, his power eventually uh, began uh, to worry Meyer Lansky uh, and Lucky Luciano, a couple of his uh, friends, and brought the attention of Thomas Dewey, who brought Dutch up in charges of extortion in 1933. Uh, Dutch was acquitted uh, in the trial, but uh, Dewey swore he was going to, he was going to get Dutch. He was going to, Dutch was going to be his number one target. He was going to get Dutch. And Dutch was mad. Uh, again, doesn't pay to be Dutch's uh, friends or enemies. And Dutch wanted to kill him. And so Dutch went to the commission and asked for permission to have Thomas Dewey killed, and the commission told him no. Told Dewey, a notable New York prosecutor, told Dewey was far too high profile uh, to kill, and told Dutch, in no uncertain terms, you will leave this man alone. Dutch said, the heck with that, I'll kill him myself. Uh, said this before the commission, um, 
couple days later, uh, the commission hired Murder Incorporated, and Dutch was no more. <laughs> All right, another good character. I think we'll, the last character I'll tell you about is Meyer Lansky. Um, Meyer Lansky is, uh, is one of my favorites in this whole list uh, because he was a successful mobster. What do I mean by successful? Well, in 1983, he died of old age at age 81. Now, that's my first, if you told Dr. Day, signs of a successful mafioso, mafiosi, the first thing on the list would be died of old age. 83 years old. Um, the second sign that was successful mof made a successful mobster, he was worth $400 million when he died. I did not stutter. $400 million. <laughs> Died in his sleep. He was born in Poland in 1902, moved to New York with his family where he met Bugsy Siegel and Lucky Luciano, and they all became very good friends and together worked for Arnold Rothstein. Uh, in 1931, uh, during the Costal Marcy War between Joe Massaria and Salvador Manzano, the mustache uh, Pete's, read about the mustache Pete's thing in your textbook. Um, during the Castellamari War, uh, Meyer convinced his friends, uh, Luciano and uh, Bugsy Siegel, uh, to kill Masari. Uh, and so they worked together to do that and set up Manzano as uh, they were going to be kind of the power behind the throne with Manzano. They expected to, they would help Manzano win the war. Uh, and then gain power for themselves, while well, Manzano sets himself up as boss of bosses and decides he wants to run all crime. And Meyer Lansky and his buddies said, you know what, we don't like that. And so four, minutes, four months later, they had him killed. Uh, afterwards, Luciano became, Lucky Luciano became the first among equals. He didn't become boss of bosses. And they called him the first among equals. And so Luciano was kind of in charge, but not. The reality was Meyer Lansky was the power behind Lucky Luciano. Um, Lansky became Luciano's consigliere, uh, his advisor, um, and he, all of Luciano's success in business really was due to Meyer Lansky's uh, work. Um, he worked. Uh, he worked. Uh, with some of the things Lansky did. He worked to bring slot machines to Los, to to New Orleans. Um, taught the mayor there how to hide money in offshore accounts. Um, he helped Batista in Cuba, and got gambling into Cuba when Batista was still in power. Um, made a lot of money off of gambling in Cuba, but saw the way the winds were blowing, and when it was became obvious that Castro was going to win. Lansky moved all, all their gambling operations out to the Bahamas, where they are today. Okay, let's do, uh, let's do, let's get some technical stuff out of the way about the mob. Um, and there are tons of other good stories, different people uh, that you would want to read about. And what I kind of suggest about, in addition to reading the stuff from this textbook, stuff you might do um, for your discussion forum is pick a name. You know, if you don't want to do one of the internet sites that I have, uh, internet resources list, one of the other possibilities um, is pick a name out of the textbook, out of the chapter, uh, out of chapter four, pick a name, read about the guy's life, and tell us what you found interesting about it. Um, you, could, yeah, you could learn a lot. Um, make sure in this chapter two you pay attention to the identities of the five families. Um, I'm going to, rather than talk about the five families, I'm going to leave that open for anyone that wants to do kind of one of those extra credit videos about uh, the five New York families. Um, if no one does them, be sure that you read about them in the textbook. Um, there's plenty of what, most of what, everything you need to know about the families is in the textbook. I'm really looking for more, more stuff about them because they really are an interesting bunch of families. Um... Let's talk about structure and organization of La Cosa Nostra in the United States. Um, and this is kind of a generalization. Not every family works this way, but this is kind of a general structure for any given crime family. So we'll look at the Gambino or the Bonanno family or the Lachesi family. They're kind of all structured the same way. Um, 
And at the top of this structure, the very stop, is a boss, or a capo cremini. Uh, the capo cremini is the head of the family. He makes all the decisions. Buck stops there. Uh, this is considered the head of the family, the guy that runs the whole thing. Slightly below and off to the side of the capo cremini is a consignulary. Um, this, the consignulary is an advisor. He's a counselor. Um, the consignulary is not necessarily a true part of the hierarchy, which is why I say he's kind of off to the side. Um, this is a very this is usually a very experienced mobster, um, often an attorney, uh, someone whose job is to advise the boss, uh, and is he may serve as a liaison between the boss and uh, the people under him, but he really isn't not really in the hierarchy. Uh, he doesn't really have people that work for him, uh, but he could be uh, the capital crimini of the boss's mouthpiece uh, to uh, the rest of the organization. Uh, directly under the boss in the hierarchy, if we talk about the hierarchy, remember the consigliere kind of off to the side, not really a part of the formal hierarchy. Um, under the boss you have an underboss, um, a sola capo, and the kind of other terms, sola capo, or a uh, capo basilare, uh, the underboss. Uh, think of him, if the boss, the capo cremini, is the owner of the company, the underboss is kind of the CEO, the guy that manages the day-to-day -day business um, and takes orders directly from the boss. Uh, now, of course, those orders may be passed down to the consigliere, but they're the orders from the boss. The underboss himself, is responsible for supervising any number of capo regimes. We'll just call them capos or lieutenants. And there may be any number of lieutenants, depending on the size of the family. But the underboss does all of his work through the capos, the capo regimes, lieutenants. And each capo regime has a crew that works for him. We call the people in the crew soldiers uh, or soldado. And the soldados... Um, these are the lowest ranking of made men. And, uh, you know, if you ever see mafioso, if you ever see mafioso here in New York or Jersey or whatever, and you run into some mafioso, um, and you see a crew, you'll know, you'll know the difference between a soldier and an associate, between a made man and a man who's not a made man. Because the soldiers, the soldados, these, this lowest rank of made men, uh, they'll get referred to as a friends of ours. And so you might have a bunch of cop over regimes sitting there talking, and so on. this friend of ours, he did this, that, or the other thing. Under the soldiers are associates. These are not made men. These are, these are grunts. These are guys that maybe want to become made men or just are around. They're associated with the mob, but they're not really a part of it. Uh, because they're not made men, they won't be referred to as friends of ours. They're friends of mine. And so if you, sir, uh, if you had a couple of, uh, you know, if you were a capo regime and you were talking to your underboss and you're talking about maybe you were uh, talking about a truck heist, you say, you know, uh, some friends of ours, they, they got, uh, uh, they got some, uh, they got the, this line on this truck full of TVs and, uh, I'm gonna they, and and Jimmy, our, a friend of friend of ours, uh, Jimmy. He said he's gonna get some of a. He said I'm gonna get some friends of mine to take care of this truck. When he says friends of mine rather than friends of ours, then they're referring to someone that he knows. He's one of his associates, but not a made man. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the crews. Again, crews are made up both of uh, made men, soldado men, friends of ours, and associates friends of mine, they do the work of the mob. These are the frontline workers. Um, they do this work at the direction of the capo regime. Um, and the soldiers, they tend to work independently. Um, and they report back to the capo regime. They kick back. They, they tell the capo regime, here's what I've been doing. They kick back some of their fun. They kick back a large percentage of their take. The capo regime keeps a little of it and kicks the rest of it back up. And money flows upwards. All activities of a soldado must be approved by a capo regime, uh, because the capo regime is the one that actually takes responsibility. Uh, and so, if you know, if this, if these friends of ours, they 
Uh, they go off to do this truck heist, and something goes wrong. Uh, and the underboss wants to hold someone responsible. He's not going to go to the soldier. He's going to go to the capo regime. He's going to the capo, and he's going to say, what happened? And we take care of this. So I'm going to take care of you. In the American Mafia, uh, you again have a commission. And this is very different from what Joe Bonanno put together in 57. Um, still even different, even a little different still than what was reformed by Luciano in 74, uh, Luciano Leguio in 74. Um, the current commission as it stands today is made up of the bosses, uh, uh, bosses of families from New York, Chicago, Buffalo, Detroit, and Philadelphia. And the commission, their duty is they coordinate and mediate between the families. Uh, in other words, they sell disputes. Uh, they approve hits or, or murders of made men. Uh, and understand one of the one of the benefits of being a made man is that you cannot be killed without the permission of the commission. The permission of the commission. The pellet with the poisons and the vessel with the pestle. The flagon with the dragon as the brew that is true. And if you like classic Danny K movies, you'll understand that. If you don't understand that, um, go to on your Netflix account or at your video store. Go rent um, the Scarlet Pimpernel. Old Danny K movie, you'll love it. It's hilarious. Anyway, sidetrack, um, and nothing to do with organized crime either. Vessel with the pestle, the pellet, the pellet with the poison, the vessel with the pestle, the flag with the dragon. That's the bruise that is true. You'll love it. Anyway, um, the commission also assigns uh, area. They they assign the families their areas of responsibility. Um, they are responsible for approving new made men. And they are liaison between La Cosa Nostra and America and the Sicilian Mafia. Um, and when I talk about the assigned areas of activity, each family has its own territory or type of activity that it operates exclusively. Um, and so, you know, like the, uh, you know, like different activities in New York might be divided among the five families. Um, whereas maybe a family in Buffalo might have control of the whole city, but it is the commission that decides who gets to do what. Uh, how do you get to be a made man so until the commission uh, approves membership? Well, understand, membership in the mafia is very exclusive. It's based on, at least originally, was based on ethnicity, family relationships, and past criminal activity. Uh, this was important because this exclusivity creates a sense of trust among the members. It, and for them, it really makes it La Cosa Nostra, this thing of ours. Um, uh, you can't petition for membership you can't ask to be a part uh, but rather uh, when uh, when made men see potential uh, they might select somebody to be made and they test them uh, and they run them through numerous other tests to decide their loyalty and how far they'll go and try and decide whether or not they're cops um, you know old school uh you know, the old school rules were that uh, to be a made man, um, you know, also called a wise guy or a good fella. Those aren't just the names of cool mob movies. Those really are what they're called, wise guys and good fellas. Um, the original rules were that you had to be of Italian descent on your father's side. There went my, there went my membership right there. Um, the old tradition was that before you could be made, uh, that you had to perform a hit, that you had to commit a murder at the direction of a boss. Um, and this was, this was, for the Mafia, a very good idea uh, because it prevented infiltration by the police uh, because there isn't, the, there isn't an undercover policeman out there that's going to kill somebody uh, to protect his cover identity. And so it kept uh, law enforcement out of, from, out of the family structure. Unfortunately, the old ways have started to die off well, unfortunately for the mob, fortunately for the rest of us. Um, now, to be a made man, you, all you really take is you got to be a good earner and to have a sponsor, someone who will uh, speak up for you, um, which is how you get uh, you know, the, your Donnie Brascos, your, your guys, that, uh, your law enforcement people that actually infiltrate. I mean, we've, had to have, we've had at least one FBI agent actually become a made man uh, because the old ways are dying out. And the old school initiation uh, was a very solemn ceremony. Um, this ceremony is kind of something that's faded, along with the old, other the old tradition that's faded in importance. 
But in the old way, according to guys like Sammy Gravano and uh, Joel Vodacci and Anthony Casso, people who have turned state's evidence, um, you know, the ceremony was fairly simple. Um, they, they, pricked your, your, they pricked your trigger finger to make it bleed, and then you would bleed on the picture of a Catholic saint, and then they would put the picture uh, in your hand and burn it. Uh, and then you were sworn in. Uh, you were sworn never to betray the mob, or and, you know, they was like, we'll never betray uh, my family. And, my family, or I will burn in hell like this card, like this this card of the saint. Um, and then everyone joined hands and sang Kumbaya. No, just they, they, everyone joined hands and then uh, welcomed the new guy into the family. Um, and again, remember, these, these new guys had to be approved uh, by the commission. Oh, let's see what else is going on. Well, let me give you, a, yeah, I got time. Let me give you one more good story. Do I have one more good story? Yeah. Let me give you one more good story. I'll finish out this lecture with one more good mob, mobster story. And I'll tell you about Ben Bugsy Siegel. Uh, Bugsy was born in 1906 in Brooklyn. Um, by age 14, something about age 14 for these guys. If you notice the pattern, uh, by age 14, uh, Bugsy was extorting money from street vendors in his neighborhood, uh, running his own little protection racket, um, soon, and there's lots of different stories about how it happened, but he, uh, soon after became friends with Meyer Lansky, uh, and him and Meyer Lansky formed their own gang. Um, you know, they, and they ran together, they stole cars, um, they ran, they did bootlegging, um, they were known particularly for killing anyone that got in their way. Um, in 19, in the 1920s, Bugsy, uh, and Meyer Lansky, Drew close to Lucky Luciano, um, and again, we've already talked about their possible involvement with the murder of Salvador Manzano. Um, at least it was suggested uh, when they got together, they all, you know, Luciano and Lansky, they sent representatives, they sent representatives of theirs to kill Salvador. They actually tried to get Bugsy to do it, um, and it's a little shaky uh, as to whether Bugsy actually did it or sent a representative. Uh, in 1930, in the 1930s, Lucky Luciano sent Bugsy to Los Angeles uh, to take over bookmaking operations from uh, Jack uh, Dragner and Mickey Cohen. Bugsy took to Hollywood. He just he loved Hollywood. It was he just he loved the atmosphere and the being around movie stars. And uh, he had a childhood friend, a uh, uh, George Raft, who was a, a an A-list actor. And Bugsy began to hang out with guys like Jack Warner and. Clark Gable and Gary Cooper. Um, he was spotted off and spotted with some young starlet on his arm, like Marie McDonald or, or Dorothy DeFacio, uh, the body. Dorothy the body DeFacio. Um, yeah, he's, he, was, he was well known. Um, how many of you knew that Clark Gable actually hung out with a mobster, right? Um, what he, for his mob-related activity in Los Angeles, he said he was responsible for setting up illegal gambling, um, he established a wire service that connected the East Coast uh, with California uh, uh, horse track betting. So it let gamblers in New York bet on horse races in California by a wire system set up by Bugsy. Um, he actually set up some of the first heroin and opium uh, routes through the U.S., uh, from the U.S. through Mexico. Bugsy's downfall began with Las Vegas and a woman named Virginia Hill. The popular story is that uh, Siegel was traveling east of L.A. and ran into this little, small, do-nothing town in Nevada and had this brilliant idea uh, for the, to, to build up this pleasure city uh, and then convinced his friends back home to invest. Uh, um, and they invested millions in what would become the Flamingo Casino and Hotel, or Casino, Flamingo Hotel and Casino. The other side of the story is that Meyer Lansky actually sent him to Vegas, uh, and then he eventually warmed up to the idea. Either way, Bugsy got into this, uh, threw himself into this project of uh, building the Flamingo Hotel, um, and was unwilling to change any of his ideas, his grand ideas for the plan. And the problem was costs for the Flamingo grew out of control, 
you know, grew up over to six million dollars, and then they got six million dollars, big deal. Remember the time. Six million dollars, nineteen forties, a lot of money. Um, his wife, Virginia Hill, this this actress that he had met out in Los Angeles, uh, left him in 1946 amid rumors that she was herself skimming money from the Flamingo Hell Flamingo Hotel project and, and hiding it in Switzerland. We'll never know. Uh, Luciano and Lasky had reservations, uh, especially when building costs uh, started to get out of hand. Uh, Luciano Lant Meyer Lansky, and these are in particular Lansky, he's the guy that was responsible for all their money. He was the, the, the money brain, so to speak. But Bugsy was fairly persuasive, and he, he convinced him. He said, it'll be okay. And so in December of 1946, the Flamingo Hotel opened. Unfortunately, remember all those good friends that, Fl that, that I told you that Bugsy had in Cal and out in Hollywood? You know, Clark Gable and Gary Cooper? By this time... They had kind of realized who Bugsy really was. Uh, Bugsy had a horrible temper. Um, and what Bugsy was counting on was his Hollywood friends, his guys like George Raft and Gary Cooper and Clark Gable, he was, and then the movie star, the starlets he was dating. He was, ex he was kind of counting on them to show up and to make uh, the debut of the Flamingo Hotel this glamorous must be event and, and bring in tons of money and really get it kicked off. And the reality was Siegel's Hollywood Bugsy's Hollywood friends, they were scared of him. Um, they had by then realized who he was. Uh, realized that he was a mobster and that he was a scary individual. And they, they didn't come. They didn't show up. They stayed away. They said, hey, I won't be anywhere near this guy. And so the grand opening of the Flamingo flopped. And then it quietly closed. And, Lant and Bugsy started changing things. Um, he reopened the hotel in March of 1947, and it started making some money. So it only stayed closed. It didn't stay closed for very long. And when they reopened it, he started making money, but by then it was too late. And the decision had already been made. Um, and then June, in June, on June 27, 1947, as he's... Uh, sitting in Virginia Hill's house in Beverly Hills, reading a newspaper. Uh, he was shot through the eye with an M1 carbine. And the killer never got found. And that is your mafia story for this week. Well, your series of mafia stories for this week. And that's it for this week. See you next week.